Hello and welcome to our latest video in our Stories from the Strong Room series. Today it is all about sun, sea and sand as we take a trip back in time to our favourite East Coast resorts in the 1920s. From Saltburn to Steadness, these towns have a rich history and have been popular tourist destinations for many years. All the photographs in this video are from the Claude William Johnson Photographic Archive, which is held by Hull University Archives at the Hull History Centre. The photographs provide a fascinating glimpse into the past, showcasing the sites and attractions that have made these towns so beloved. From the Victorian architecture of Saltburn to the bustling promenades of Skegness, these photographs capture the essence of the towns and their unique charms. Join us as we take a journey through time and rediscover the historic beauty of these East Coast gems. And if you like the photos in this video, please check out my earlier video looking at the Janssen photographs of Hull in the 1920s. There's a link in the description in case you want to check it out. If you've seen my previous video on Hull in the 1920s, you'll have heard all about the Janssen family, so I won't repeat it all here. But to summarise, the Janssen family first became involved in the photography business when their patriarch William Janssen opened a photography shop with his brother in Liverpool around the turn of the 20th century. Over the years, William and his family moved several times and changed from taking photographic portraits to publishing topographical postcards. By the mid-1920s, the family had produced approximately 300 series of postcards encompassing cities, towns and villages across a large geographical area, including North Staffordshire, Lincolnshire, Yorkshire and Nottingham. A jaunt to the seaside is a long established British tradition, although the first holidays were usually for health reasons rather than for pure recreation. In fact, Scarborough lays claim to being Britain's first seaside resort, attracting large crowds as early as the 1660s, after the discovery of its stream of acidic water was publicised widely, and thus Scarborough Spa was born. By the mid 18th century, doctors and physicians were extolling the benefits of sea bathing even claiming it could cure scurvy, leprosy and jaundice. Rolling bathing machines started to appear on British beaches. Scarborough had some by 1735. However, the newly developing coastal resorts were the preserve of the elite. Only those with the means, the time and the transport could enjoy the benefits of a seaside retreat. And with such a distinguished clientele and the limited amount of time that could actually be spent sea bathing, it is no surprise that other businesses began to establish themselves to cater to the well-off tourists. Towns built theatres, assembly rooms and hotels. They became the type of seaside resort we would recognise today. Economic progress from industrialisation, higher wages, greater disposable incomes and the development of the railway meant that in the 19th century, seaside holidays became increasingly attainable. Indeed, the Railway Regulation Act 1844, ensured that affordable travel would be available for all classes. Anyone who could afford a train ticket could have a day or days at the seaside. The tradition of British seaside holidays had truly arrived. Further development of resorts occurred during the interwar years and included the opening of Britain's first holiday camp, Butlin Skegness, in 1936. However, with the introduction of budget airlines and package holidays, the British seaside holiday entered a decline from the 1960s. The closure of railway lines also significantly affected visitor numbers. The golden era of British seaside holidays may have passed, but recent investment programmes and community endeavours have created a tourism revival for some resorts. And as we all know, there's nowhere else Brits want to be on a hot day than on the beach. Saltburn by the Sea is the most northern of the East Coast resorts featured in the Claude William Johnson collection. Saltburn was still a hamlet in the 1850s, but by the end of the century it had been turned into a bustling seaside town. It also boasts the only pleasure pier on the northeastern Yorkshire coast. The pier has changed remarkably little since this photo, with only an extension to the two buildings at the start of the pier, making room for a small amusement arcade. This view has also changed very little, 
a few new buildings, including that ubiquitous seaside necessity, a fish and chip shop, and obviously a lot more cars, but otherwise pretty much unaltered. Constructed between 1883 and 1884, the Funicular Railway Saltburn Cliff Lift is the oldest water balanced cliff lift in the UK. It replaced an older vertical cliff hoist after the discovery of rotten timbers and its tendency to stop halfway. And no trip to Saltburn would be complete without taking in the Valley Gardens and Italian Gardens. A peaceful and relaxing stroll away from the hustle and bustle of the seafront. Although you do have a fair uphill walk to get to the main town. The gardens also include a miniature railway, should you have any young children in need of entertainment. A little down the coast and we arrive at Whitby, famous for its abbey, Lucky Ducks, Jet and Dracula. Whitby has long been an important settlement, even before it became a true holiday destination during the Georgian period, when it became a fashionable spa town. Here is a lovely view of the old Whitby Spa, with the two piers in the background. A promenade and sunken gardens were created at the top of the cliff, but no cliff lifts, so a steep walk down the hill is still required to reach the beach and parts of the town. And if anyone asks, it is definitely 199 steps, not 200, to reach the Abbey. Our next stop is Bridlington. A fishing port long before it became a seaside resort in the 19th century, it remains the largest lobster port in Europe. It's now also known for its many amusement arcades, permanent seafront fairground rides and land train running all the way from South Beach to Subi Hall. The traditional donkey ride can also be enjoyed in the summer months. Here's a lovely photograph of the inside of the Floral Hall. It played host to bands and other entertainers such as comedians, but sadly it burnt down in 1923. And here we have proof that Bridlington has been a popular tourist destination for decades. Anyone who's been to Bridlington on a summer day, or frankly even a fairly cold day in March, knows that you need to be prepared for crowds both on the promenades and on the beach. Just a hop, skip and a jump down the coast and we arrive at Hauntsey. A good beach for fossil hunting, but a little less popular than Bridlington. So it can be easier to find a place to pitch your towels and windbreakers. This view of 1920s Hauntsey is remarkably similar to today. The floral hall still stands and the sea walls are largely the same, although with a few more safety barriers. And if you don't happen to fancy the beach, there's always the Mere, the largest freshwater lake in Yorkshire, used as a base for the Royal Naval Air Service and later the RAF during the First World War. It is now a popular location for bird watching and sailing. Our last stop in Yorkshire is Withensea. Here we have a view of the central promenade leading to the old pier towers. The towers used to mark the entrance to the pier which was originally 365 metres long. Sadly, several impacts by local ships left the pier at only 15 metres before it was finally removed in 1903. And here's evidence of Withensea's popularity before the railway from Hull was removed. Large crowds on the beach, enjoying traditional amusements such as swing boats and carousels, and of course, the seaside staple ice cream. Now into Lincolnshire. Our first port of call is Mablethorpe. Here we have a photograph of the main promenade, busy and boasting plenty of places for refreshments. No longer the tourist hotspot it was in the 1920s. Since it was filled in in the 1930s, this is Mablethorpe's bathing basin. For those who did not fancy risking swimming in the sea, you could enjoy the Karma Basin and be watched by plenty of onlookers. Temporary diving towers were also created on occasion if you were feeling a little braver. Our last Mablethorpe photo is probably not a sight you would see today. A temporary stage on the beach and a dance troupe entertaining the masses. In the background a row of bathing tents can be seen 
presumably a popular alternative to the beach hut. We have now arrived at our final destination, Skegness. Popular with the local gentry from the late 18th century, Skegness, as with many coastal resorts, enjoyed a boom in tourism with the arrival of the railway. It quickly became a popular holiday destination for East Midlanders, and in 1936 was home to the first Butlins holiday resort. This photograph is of the original rock gardens, which have been recently restored. I bet many children enjoyed walking across those stepping stones. This is the old figure eight roller coaster, which was built in 1908. It replaced an earlier switchback railway or roller coaster, which had opened in Skegness in the 1880s. I'm not sure about you, but I don't think I'd have had a go at the figure eight. It doesn't look particularly sturdy. And lastly, the Skegness Boating Lake and Pier. The boating lake was first built in 1924 and later extended in 1932. It remains a popular spot, offering rowing boats and pedalos, and the entertainments on offer may have changed over the years, but the pier also proudly remains. Originally, the pier had a concert hall, saloon and theatre. Not sure what Victorian visitors would make of rock climbing, laser quest and escape rooms these days. I hope you've enjoyed this tour of our beloved East Coast in the 1920s, from windswept Saltburn to the equally windswept Skegness. The Yorkshire and Lincolnshire coasts have a proud tradition of providing great seaside resorts for tourists and locals alike. Long may it continue. I've put a link in the description to the collection's online catalogue if you'd like to know more about the collection and its photographs. Thanks for watching, and please keep an eye out for our next Stories from the Strong Rooms video, which will be available next month.